So I'm going to hand over now to Andy Chandler from Adjust. Please give him a big uh, round of applause and uh, welcome him to the virtual conference stage. Thank you very much. And yeah, thanks to everyone at, at APS for, for bringing us all together. Um, you know, important at the, the best of times is definitely important right now. I hope everyone joining is staying healthy both physically and mentally. Um, so yeah, I'm Andy Chandler. I'm GM for the UK at Adjust. Uh, at Adjust, we're always trying to make app marketing um, uh, simpler, smarter, and, and more secure. Um, and automation is really at the at the core of that um, because it allows marketers um, to to be able to do what they need to be able to do to to make um, their businesses successful and and to be able to focus on those things the marketers are skilled at rather than a lot of the the mundane tasks. And we're very happy to, to be able to bring a, a, a perspective from, a, from a, a great mobile veteran who is actually using Adjust Automation already um, to, to, to be able to bring uh, business outcomes to, to his business. So I'll ask Andrew just to, to briefly um, introduce himself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, it's a first for me to do this kind of web-based or web-first um, event and thanks to James and the team for putting it on. I think it's a really great initiative that, that came together really fast. Um, we we're also just kind of talking um, before this, but I actually was at the first app promotion summit in 2013 um, back in back in Knightsbridge. So great to see the event uh, flourishing. Um, currently, I'm working with a company called Coda, uh, which is a games publishing business. Um, and our, our real point of differentiation is we have a platform um, where you can draw data and insight into which games are, are working, what's trending, um, you know, which mechanics are doing well. Um, and our overall vision as a, as a business is to automate games publishing. So um, we've got a long journey ahead of us, but clearly you know, UA being a key part of games publishing, it's important to have that, that automation step in, in place early. So looking forward to going through these, these questions. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, and yeah, please do um, do write some some questions that you want uh, myself and Andrew to, to answer. So far, we've just got just got the one asking when you're going to update your photo, Andrew. So um, obviously, that's uh, who, who is that's, that from? That's, that's from um, Matt Walsh. Um, so you can you can pick that up with him afterwards. Um, yeah, nice, nice. But, but yeah, yeah, please do do add some um, questions from the audience. We'd love to hear what's important to, to you. Obviously, we'll try and make this as helpful as possible. As an added incentive for the five most engaging questions, um, we're going to be able to send a little voucher out to other people who ask those questions. Um, Andrew, so yeah, you, you've you've mentioned um, kind of that that longevity um, in the industry. The first time that we were on a panel was actually back in 2014 at, at Adweek. I'd love to hear your perspective um, about how how kind of the the use of data has really changed and and evolved over over the time in in mobile. Yeah, I mean, another Gregor's just logged in as well. I assume he's a more of a veteran than me. But um, so yeah, when I you know when I started in mobile advertising was with a mobile agency called Somo. Um, some of you may know or, or may not know, but um, there was sort of an early pioneer really in in mobile advertising. And what the, the opportunity that existed then um, was that the mobile advertising landscape had gone from a, a small number of mobile network operators. Um, so if you wanted to run advertising um, pre the iPhone, essentially, you were going to Orange O2, Vodafone, etc. And there was a handful of large enough independent publishers, a company called Flirtomatic was one that was pretty big at the time, some of the news journalists and publishers. To this world of <clears throat> thousands of apps that was proliferated by the release of the App Store. Um, you know, and that made a huge difference because you're advertising in 10 places to, to 10,000 places. So suddenly the, the, the requirement for, for data became huge to be able to understand what you were doing, where you were advertising, where you were spending. And at SOMO, you know, we, we had a, a really great vision for, for marketing automation to start with the reporting. Um, and the idea was is that we would take the data from the networks um, and use that as the basis for our reporting. And then of course you use all of your reporting data for ongoing optimizations and, and you know, changes to your, to your ads, your bids, your budgets, et cetera. Um, but back then in 2009, 2010, which is when that photo is from, um, most people didn't have um, reporting APIs, probably only half the networks really had reporting APIs. 
Uh, Facebook wasn't really that, that well established, it was just launching, um, or perhaps even pre their mobile advertising proposition. Um, so we set up a system where those that had a reporting API, we would ingest that data. For others, we would ask them to upload a CSV into an S3 bucket. And then for some, they would email us um, their, their report. We would then extract it and then try and put all of those together. And, and every day we would do this, and every day something would be missing and the system would break. Right? So you'd either have um, spend data would be missing or install data would be missing, and it was a real nightmare. And you'd end up in a position where you were manually aggregating all of that data together. Um, <clears throat> and so that took hours and hours and hours of just getting a report together every day. Um, and as time's gone on, networks now have reporting APIs. You, know, you no longer take the, you know, we were taking install data then from the ad networks, right? We were using attribution partners, um, you know, Tune but back in the day, AdEx um, as well um, for various different clients, neither of which are, are, are sort of around in the same guise today. But um, you take that data um, and pull your report. Now you take all of the um, data from a single source that for us is typically a just. Um, where we can aggregate that into one place. So you come to work in the morning, um, half eight, nine o'clock or whatever, and you've got a single source of truth there. So you've gone from huge, huge fragmentation to, to consolidation of data into one place. So it makes a big, big difference to be able to make decisions and then focus on optimizations, et cetera. So. And, and with, that, with that kind of fragmentation reducing, um, and now coming to that single, single source of truth, as you say, obviously the, the step, past that is then actually being able to automate the the decision making process on on that data um obviously you, you, automation is key to, key to your business what were, what were some of the first first things that you actually did when you started using adjust automate you know what were the first kind of steps that if people are, are, are just kind of thinking about should i should i take those first steps shouldn't i you know can you talk about uh, about kind of you know what you did yeah, well, I think there's 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 two there's two threads really for for using I mean any automation solution. We've chosen to work with Adjust and uh, um, and and your control center and Adjust and um, Automate for two reasons. Um, but the first reason is is thread one is that you need to have a single source of truth. So you know you need to have all of your data, revenue data, cost data, attribution data in a, in a single place. Um, to be able to use that efficiently and to be able to use that effectively. And so given our, our data, oh, there we go, given our data from, you know, from spend, um, revenue and attribution set in adjust, it's very logical to use the automation flow um, and automation toolkit from adjust. So that's piece one for us is getting that into a, into a usable format. But piece two for me is the most important and it's that everyone, um, I've got a little question pop up. Uh, I'm not. I'm not wearing pajamas. No, no. Half and I'm half. Not, you sure? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not half and half. How do I close this? Um, and um, and so the second part, as I was saying, is to have the um, the 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 confidence. And what I see happen so often is people automate, you know, pretty pretty large parts of their optimization. So if if CPI goes up by ten percent. And you know, revenue doesn't then reduce bid by 10%. These you kind know, of if this, then that type type rules. And then maybe if you're running, you know, hundreds of campaigns across hundreds of markets on, on lots of platforms, then people come in in the morning and they look at all of those automations to see what they did. And so what we've worked on is a series of tests to put these rules in place. Pretty simple. Um, if, if revenue goes up by 10%, increase bid by 10%. If revenue goes down by 10%, decrease bid by 10%. Put these rules in place um, and then let, let the, the, the product automate those, check them, and then it builds the confidence that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. So for me, that's really the most important thing is letting it run and having the confidence in doing it. And then you scale up more and more rules. And you have the confidence because you know the data is accurate because it's in one place and it's validated. And that's how we, we're planning to scale up the use of the tools across more games and, and more, more networks, essentially. And what, what do you think sort of once that confidence is, is in place, obviously there's a lot of heavy lifting that, that just goes away. What, what would you say are some of the, the kind of positives to have come from that, from, from your team? Yeah, so I think you know, ultimately with any 
app promotion strategy, you're trying to maximize your return, right? And it's not just about maximizing sort of direct profits or, or direct, um, you know, um, sort of cost versus revenue, but there's always a trade off, right? I can grow my revenue, but I might get a smaller margin um, or I can do less revenue, but get a bigger margin sometimes. And it's kind of balancing all of those things together. And the other thing is that with Coda, we have multiple games in market. Some games have, you know, a seven to 10 day LTV profile. Some games have 90 to 120 day LTV profile. So having time away from operations, we can focus on LTV modeling on, on game lifetime modeling. So if you've got a game that's going to make money for 90 days, you're investing on day one with a plan to get a return on, on day 90. And so you need to be able to model to say, well, how much revenue do I expect to get on the first three days or seven days or, or first 14 days? And that is quite complicated. That does take time. Um, and you need to really think about that. And then you don't just have one, you know, one answer to that because your, your lifetime value from Facebook might be different to your lifetime value from um, Bungle or Unity, for example. And so what you can then start to spend time on is modeling that to say, well, actually, I know that if I get to 50% uh, of my uh, revenue, uh, my cost back on day 30, then I'm going to hit that benchmark. Um, or I know that if I, if I get 60% back of my cost by day 60, I'm going to hit that benchmark. So you can start to build a lot of those models, which means you can be more confident in your investment decisions and you can grow your scale because you've got better, better grasp of it. And then the second thing, um is and it's it's something that everybody talks about uh, but is around creative and creative optimization and creative improvements um and in in a world where the the, the platforms have you know tons and tons of data and tons of user insights the ability to you know and with facebook and google you know they kind of auto optimize a lot of your campaigns so the ability to gain an advantage for me really comes down to that creative strategy and there's, there's lots of stuff you can do that's iterative, right? So people talk about, you know, you might change a red background or a blue background or a green background. You might have this call to action. You might have a different call to action. In, in gaming, call outs are really popular. So, you know, if you, if you beat this level, you're legally skilled or can you, uh, you know, or if you, if you can beat this, you're a ninja or, you know, whatever else, only 1% of people can do this. So you can test all of those things, but that's pretty quick and easy. The, the harder thing to test is new concepts, new ideas, new gameplay. So do you bring in some real life footage in line with the game and try and mash that up together? And that takes time to think about the ideas, to set the testing framework. And so really having time away from operations for me and my team means we can focus much more on you know, LTV modeling and game lifecycle to really maximize that and then really focus on creative ideation and creative strategy. They're the two big wins for us from, from automation. <clears throat> Yeah, so that's thanks. That's, that's really interesting. I, I and I want to kind of pick pick both parts um, uh, apart almost. I'm interested to sort of when you when you were starting to bring in automation, we were talking to the team about automation, and obviously sort of saying that there would be more time for them to be able to do the, the modeling and the more complex. Did you have any any pushback from the team? Was there was there any you know, was there any fears about, oh, you know, this is, this is taking over what we do or were people very keen to be able to do the more interesting, the more interesting stuff? I mean, from, 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 from our side, it was very, very well supported. I mean, you say to somebody, we can take away a lot of the heavy lift for you to free up your time for streaming. Mean, people love that, right? People love that, yeah. that concept. I think that's, that's a big win. And as, and as a company, Coda wants to automate games publishing. So you know, automation and data-driven decision-making is in our DNA. Uh, so from a company perspective, that's, that's really big and really popular. Um, before Coda, I was with Smartly, which is a Facebook marketing platform. Um, and they have a huge number of automation tools um, for helping you to be more effective on Facebook. And I think that was sometimes more of a question. You know, when you look at big teams or, or big agencies and they say, well, actually, we can automate a lot of this work, that often became a, um, a discussion. But I still bring it back to the fact that if you can get a machine to do what the person's going to do anyway, um, you know, if you, can, if you can do that and free up that time, providing you're doing the right things with your time, you're going to get better results. So it's a net benefit. So, so there's always a way around that, I think. 
uh, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I've never met anyone that in in the industry that I thought that they they're maximizing out their potential by by clicking on the uh, clicking to up bids and then clicking on check boxes. So, um, and then on the the, the creation uh, the creative um, iteration, interesting just to sort of get a sense with automation and the possibilities of automation have, have bought on that side, just roughly how many more campaigns from a creative point of view do you think you're, you're running? You know, is it, is it, is it 10% more? Is it, is it doubling? I'm just sort of interested in, in kind of your view on, on just how many more campaigns and campaign creative, I guess, that, that you can actually run. Yeah, I, to be honest, I've, I've been completely guessing. I've just been making up a number, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I don't know if we, if we necessarily um, test like thousands more creatives and thousands more campaigns. Um, I think it's really more about the, the quality of what you're testing and just taking the time to ideate. Because, you know, if... As, as a UA manager, you're, you're time bound, right? You know, you've got your day at work and you've got a priority of tasks. So you, you, if, if, your, if your CPI is running above your, your, your lifetime value, then you've got, to, you've got to make those changes to those campaigns because every install and every, every piece of activity, you're, you're losing money, right? So you, you have to do those things um, operationally first. So you just don't have the time to work and sit down on creative ideation. And often it might take you, you know, an hour or two to actually sit in a room and start with an idea that's probably pretty shit, to be honest. And then you get the idea that comes off it and then it takes that time. So I think it's more about the quality versus if you don't have time, it's just like, well, we've got this idea. Let's try it. Fine. Um, whereas, whereas when you've got time, you can think, well, actually, let's spitball this a bit. Let's work through the process. What are the other alterations? How can we move this forward? So it's not so much about volume of creative testing. Um, I think it's much more about quality um, and the time to ideate properly. Brilliant, thanks. Um, I wonder if there's if there's anything that has come up um, with that kind of extra time that automations enabled you to to have. Is there, is there anything over the top of of what you've discussed about now, or that you were expecting that actually? You, you sort of seen a, a real benefit from, you know, something that you perhaps weren't expecting, but, but has been a, a nice surprise. Um, I think, well, we're pretty early in our journey with automation. So, you know, I think we, we haven't had a, a wow moment or like, a, you know, we, we were never able to do this before um, type, type moment. Um, and obviously we have a pretty clear plan about what we want to do. Um, what I would say, one of, the, one of the benefits that we have seen that perhaps we didn't explicitly expect, um, we test a lot of games um, and we do most of that testing on Facebook. Um, and we have been able to set up some, some rule sets with, with, um, with Automate um, to enable us to control those. So um, you know, if you get this many users, then stop the campaign, those types of rules. Um, that previously we were running using Facebook's own tools, right? In their in their native in their native tools, that we can then control centrally through um, through 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 Automate. So that's one area I think we have been able to 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 improve that we hadn't expected to, um, but no specific over the top or wow moments as yet. But hopefully some will will come. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and and kind of talking about that and and you know the sort of projecting in into the future. What, what sort of, uh, as some of you obviously, nothing, uh, nothing too sensitive uh, as, uh, as your advantage, but what are some of the things that you feel that the next steps for automation can, can bring to the industry as a, as a whole once everyone's actually using it and, you know, things, it becomes commonplace? Yeah, well, for, for us, it's, it's really about scale, right? So as a, as a publisher, you know, we want to be launching, you know, hundreds of games. That's our that's our vision, right? Our vision is to level the playing field so game creators can do what they love, which is make games, and that we can bring hundreds of games to market. And so I don't know about what's coming next, but it would just be a continual increase in, 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 in automating everything that we possibly can. And that will really be our, our focus. And we're going to be brutally 
aggressive on on making sure that if we do something three days in a row we find a way to automate that um, and so i think it's about being able to scale our operational capacity without massively scaling our operational headcount and the team will still grow you still need people you still need brains you still need people to program the rules etc but at the moment you know maybe you've got a ua manager can handle four games or five games you know with with the right tools in place we believe a UA manager could maybe handle 20, 30, 40 games. Um, and that's a huge amount. And so the, the, the automation has to be there and has to be in, in place, I think. Um, and you know, I would hope that at some point in the future, you can even automatically set up campaigns as well, right? It's a bit of a way off, but um, you, know, you can automatically set up campaigns, campaign APIs become more prevalent. And so you, you can, yeah automatically duplicate campaigns automatically set up new campaigns you know and then that actually helps you to scale up a lot more so that'd be something probably as a next step um in the next 12 to 18 months that would be good to see thank you yeah brilliant i mean i, I think yeah definitely it talks to the the size of the team no longer being kind of the amount of work output that the, the people can can actually do which is which is great it then becomes about everyone being kind of more intelligent about their campaigns um rather than just having you know more people to to, to go through to go through more um excel sheets um you touched on it briefly just just previously and i'd like to to go back because we wanted to make it a a point of um of the discussion but to kind of have the the sort of kpis that you are actually automating against i mean i, I would imagine that most of them are, are fairly obvious but kind of wanted to make actual you know practical um practical examples for for, for people listening in and um, can you just talk about some of the you know some of the the kpis that you're you're automating automating against in the full engine um with with the adjust automate yeah you mean in terms of the business kpis or in terms of our internal yeah. kpis for automation no it, as far as the business kpis are concerned yeah i mean the, the main one is is just responding to changes in in revenue and changes in in arpu um you know, because that's that is a big part of what a ua manager does right if you know, if the if the if the cost of um if, if the return from a particular source goes goes down then you need to to bid less so our, our, a lot of our focus is around um arpu based decision making um, and having cpi in line with arpus not having to do those changes um manually and you know in in gaming you do see a fluctuation in in in, in arpus um you do see a fluctuation in in revenues because you know we have a much shorter life cycle if you look at some of the um um the the, the sort of the, the the more well known apps i guess like you know netflix or 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 spotify these guys have a pretty stable forecast of revenue per user right it's a subscription model you know that a user is going to give you 9.99 a month or whatever they're going to give you 120 dollars a year average life cycle is 3 years 360 dollars you know, you know, your operating cost is $180. You can afford to spend $180 to acquire it. It's pretty fixed, right? Whereas with, with gaming, you know, you see um, CPM changes, you see fill rate changes, you, you see movements in, in your game um, revenue on a pretty regular basis for, for multiple reasons. So, you know, we don't obviously want to be going seesawing up and down and making massive shifts, but those small kind of micro incremental shifts that we can make um through 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 um uh, automate is is really where we are and that means you just keep you know your revenue and cost in a nice balance um and as i said then you can look at where can i grow where can i increase setting up new campaigns and setting up new networks and new markets but those day-to-day -day operations is really the kpis we focus to which is changes in revenue changes in in income or lcv uh, versus changes in cpi and changes in in cost and they're the, the major things that we do yeah absolutely and and yeah you know we see across the board across the the clients as a whole very very similar um kpis that people are using um you know even down to the dltb modeling and um kind of forecasting the the return on ad spend um across you know different different um you know days um day one day three day seven um so yeah very very similar but 
definitely a, a way to just be able to automate some of those some of, some of those tasks that it's as you say just spend and money coming in money going out and, and you know pretty pretty simply put um so i'll uh, i'll kick out to to the questions um that have that have come in um one great one that i'd I'd like to start with is actually um, what internal resources were needed uh, for, from you to get the automation up and running um, and was was getting that resource signed off very easy or, or very difficult from, from the business point of view? Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you for, for the question, um, whoever shared that. But um, so we're a relatively small company and we're relatively young. So we're just over a year old, we're about 35 people or so in the in the company. So we're really, at the moment, at least the whole organization is united around a very clear vision. Um, and, and that vision, as I said, is to automate games publishing and, and help creators do what they love, which is, which is making games. So in terms of getting hold of resources, it, it wasn't really like got to get this from team A and this from team B. I think it was very much around as a collective what we want to achieve. And then what can team A, B and C do to, to achieve that, that same thing? Um, and I, probably we had a pretty big advantage in that we've used Adjust since we started the company. Um, and so our, our data engineering and our, I don't know if that, that was even an expression, but our data was in the right format and was already working. Um, so a lot of the work had been done upstream to make sure that, that everything's named properly and adjust and we're setting up the right, um, you know, the right um, tracking URLs, et cetera, and everything's in a good space. Um, we did have to do a couple of tweaks to changing some of our tracking names and to um, validating a few pieces of, um, of revenue data. We had a couple of challenges with, with some um, data not matching for multiple reasons, but um, the, the product team was able to help with that um to to put that infrastructure in place to 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 work with the um adjust team to get that right and then once that was in place then it was really on the growth team to execute so i think they were the two the two parts of it um really the the product engineering guys that that help to make sure everything's working from a um a data perspective if you will and then the, the growth team to execute but we were lucky because as i said we were united around that that common vision so um yeah, I would just say actually just to perhaps to add that I wouldn't underestimate the importance of making sure everything in Adjust is, is in the right place and named as you want it to be. I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest piece of advice I could give there. Great. Um, and another question kind of just building on the, on the back of that as well. Um, and it's from an anonymous attendee, so unfortunately I won't be getting the, the vouchers. But um, they said, uh, what, what skill sets do you, do you now recruit for um, to become a, an automate, you know, an automated UA um, specialist. Is there a different skill set that you look for now um, than, than you would have done in the past? I don't think it's a different skill set now um, in terms of the past, but I think the UA profile has changed massively over the last four or five years. So UA UA people used to be media buyers, in in, in my in my opinion, right? They'd have relationships with networks. They'd be doing lunches, um, you know, they'd be going out and, and building those kind of relationships and you'd be really trading on, 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 on relationship and then buying relatively not simplistically, but relatively easily. It wasn't super, super technical. And then what changed, I think, was, was a few things, but was consolidation in the industry and consolidation of supply sources. So when we were at, at Somo, you know, sometimes we'd run across 30, 40, 50 networks. Um, and I call them networks as a, as a grandiose title, but some of these are just arbitrage shops selling crap. Um, and most of those have dwindled and moved and, and, and left. And now you're into a much more mature industry when, when networks have SDK you know, integrations, you've got the platform, so you're much more consolidated in terms of your, your spend. So the, the profiles now, are much more data driven, much more analytical, um, and, and really comfortable with numbers. And not always as good socially in lunches and, and, and drinks, et cetera, that you'd have before. But that side of things, whilst it's nice, doesn't really matter in, in a world of data. So I think the shift's happened over the past four or five years anyway with, with UA, and that the UA guys today are, are more than capable of you know, working with the automation side of things. So. Great. 
thanks no I appreciate that um another question that we've had in um this uh, this person called anonymous attendee is is asking all sorts of questions but um wondered uh, what the quick wins for, for automation are and and whether there was anything that's actually harder to do now that you now that you have automation yeah i think i think the, the quick wins is is things like um if if cpi goes up by 10 percent or 20 percent just just pause the campaign right i mean that's the they're, they're quick wins and um if you've got a campaign spending i don't know 240 dollars a day for argument's sake and someone gets in at, at nine o'clock in the morning you might not get to that campaign until four o'clock in the afternoon so it's like six seven hours or whatever spending ten dollars an hour it's 67 dollars that gets spent if you've got a rule set that says if cpi has gone above 20 percent up pause the campaign that campaign got paused at 9 a.m or 8 a.m or midnight whenever that action happens right so so it just saves you money it literally just saves you money so that's a big easy easy win um if, if anything's harder, um, I think the harder thing is back to where I started with is just the discipline of of not checking. Right? So it's it's like for me that's the that's the harder thing. It's you, you, still there's a tendency to want to be in control. Humans like to be in control, and um, you know I think and I as a question I saw from Gregor, we can take in a second, but. One of the things with the, the coronavirus that, that I think people struggle with is they don't feel in control. They don't feel that, that, that they have that, like that independence or that autonomy or that ability to, um, to, to make decisions and do what they want. And I think that same behavior trait is really hard to stop. It's very subconscious. And, and, and so with the UA side of things, you wanna be in control, right? And at the end of the month, if my UA guy says to me, um, yeah, we, we did great automation, but we missed every financial goal for the game. It's not going to work, right? That's not going to not going to be as an excuse. So there's still a really difficult inward like um, pull to go and check it. And that's the thing I think that, that I find the hardest. I don't know if it's harder, but it's new. So it's hard not to check. And that's something you've really got to wrestle with and find a way around it. Um, because you just end up duplicating your work and really losing a lot of those benefits. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, just the change in psychology that, that you have to have from it because because it is automated. And yeah, it's an interesting, interesting point because otherwise, yeah, what's what's the point of, of having it if you're just going to do it anyway? Um, yeah. Great. Um, just uh, it'd be great just to, to kind of go into some um, kind of actual nitty gritty um, questions as well. So, so we have someone, um, Sophia, actually asking about um optimizing uh, bids and budgets based on ltv models um and the, the the ability to still be able to kind of check them before they before they suddenly go off and and make changes i presume that you're you're doing that fairly fairly simply through adjust automate yeah and that's a i think it's a product question for you andy but um i'll <laughs> answer it and make sure i get the right answer um, i'll be checking my my, my belief is is that there's two ways to work with 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 um uh, automate uh, one is to have recommended changes um, and two is to have automated changes. So, so typically what we do is we have a list of changes that get recommended based on a rule set. And then we just go in and click those to execute those. So I think unless I'm wrong, but in answer to Sophia's question, then yes, um, a, a Automate would suggest these changes. Then you go in and click yes, you want to action. Yeah, absolutely. We were, it's, it's not testing. It's not testing you. Uh, but, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, obviously about being able to get the, the automation in place, but be, still being able to control the, the campaigns as and, as and when they come up um, is, is yeah central to, to Automate as a whole. Could, could we take, there's a question from Anonymous about Facebook and Google, and then there was a, could we take that question next? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think that was... Uh, so yeah, why why invest in automation yourself when Facebook and Google are building it into their platforms? Yeah, I mean, so um, I think it's a good it's a good question. Um, the, the the simple reason for us is that we want to have a single view across all platforms and all channels. So so what works in Facebook sits in Facebook. What works in Google sits in Google. And what we want to have is essentially a meta layer above that with a single view. 
So that's one of the reasons we use Adjust in general to have that single view of data. And we want to be able to, to um, have a, um, a control over all of the platforms and all of the channels. I don't know where the roadmap is for, for the product in the long term, but I would, I would hope that at some point in the future, we'd be able to make changes looking at holistic view of our, of our games. So there's either two types of advertising, either bid constrained or budget constrained. Um, if you're budget constrained, then you want to maximize your return across channels. So you want to have something that sits across Facebook, Google, you know, Unity, Bungle, et cetera, and you can take budget between those and optimize between those. And you'll never be able to do that with Facebook on Google and Google on Facebook. So that's the, that's the reason for that. Yeah, absolutely. And it is about, yeah, working across as, as many platforms as, as possible, obviously, to, to make sure that your LTV is as high as, as it can be holistically from a, from a campaign point of view. And obviously, we work very closely with, with Facebook and Google and anything that they're doing um, from an automation and, and kind of um, automating bids and things like that. Obviously, we work with them very closely to be able to then um, see the benefits of those in the platform. But having that wider spread um, across as, as many different sources as, as possible is, is, as you say, obviously, um, yeah, very, very important. Um, so I think we have time just for a couple, uh, a couple more um, questions. Um, let me just uh, scroll through them quickly. Um, uh, interesting one from, from, an, uh, from a, an agency. Um, about optimizing multiple campaigns, um, you know, hundreds of, of campaigns. Um, what happens if there are, are discrepancies? I mean, yeah, I, I can speak a little bit to that. I mean, obviously, the, the Automate platform can can work across multiple campaigns and can work across multiple apps, um, as, as um, Andrew and Coder are, are using it. Um, I think it, it's a, it's about as you, as Andrew's already said, having that that central point of, of single source of truth for, for the data then becomes um, really crucial um, so that, so that you're, you're pulling all of the data into one place, there's one single source of truth, and then you're making decisions based on that um, in order to be able to, to make the campaigns as, as effective as, as possible. Um, definitely, yeah, get in, get in touch with um, anyone from an agency and we'd, uh, we'd like to talk to about how this, how this product can, can roll out and, and help you guys as well because obviously it, it, agencies especially then have you know could have multiple campaigns multiple clients um, and the, the automation definitely definitely helps with with all of that as well yeah i would um, just say there about discrepancies as as mm. well um because i've just gone through all of the month end reporting um this this week and and looking at the the numbers and we, we're seeing less than less than two percent discrepancies across the board now um two percent still not perfect but actually when when we look at this it's we, we're pretty comfortable with that level of 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 discrepancy so um generally it's okay and then for all of the media that we most of the media that we buy you know, everything's based on adjust attribution numbers anyway so so i think if there's a discrepancy as long as you're using the adjust numbers, which is your source of truth, then typically you'd be able to resolve that if there was an issue. Um. Yeah, and and obviously, you know, part of the part of the automate process is also the the KPI that uh, the the report is actually only showing you the the campaigns that you that you need to take action on and what the suggested action is. So you know, even even with that, it means that you're not having to go through literally every every single campaign. Um, and obviously it means that you should just use it adjust for, for all of your data needs. Um, well, one, one more question, just I think it is an interesting one. When people talk about automation, I think AI um, comes, into, comes into it. Um, someone asking where you see the, the role for AI in the next sort of three to five years. Um, you know, will there, will there be a moment when app marketers will simply be able to offload um, all ad campaigns just to run on on API and uh, on on AI uh, from your from your point of view. Um, yeah, it's a uh, it's difficult. Got a little pop up there. Just rereading the question. Um, so um, I don't. I struggle to to really differentiate between like you know AI and, and machine learning 
and um, you know, data science because there's so much overlap um, and it's, it's very buzz, buzzwordy, I think, uh, still in that area. Um, so so from, a, from a, a definition of me for, for AI, I would kind of cross over a bit with machine learning. And this is having basically automated models. So I see data science as kind of manually understanding data and, and manually exploring and extrapolating data. And I see kind of machine learning and AI as having machines to build the model and then to interpret and action the, the data. Um, and um, I believe that will take, I mean, three to five years is probably a fair time frame. I think it will, it will come. I think it needs to come. Um, and uh, Coda as a, as a publishing business have our own SDK. Um, and our SDK contains attribution and measurement and it contains monetization. And one of the reasons we have our own SDK is it helps us to really control the data flow and really control the information flow. So we're constantly working on, on gathering that data. We're constantly working on machine learning models um, to enable us to do that. Um, and we do believe that large chunks of that can be done in the future through machine learning and AI. Um, but you'll, you'll always need, I think, that that creative piece, um, which again can be done via AI, I, I'm, I'm led to believe. Um, but I think you'll you'll still have that human element of the creative that that just drives that slightly extra piece of performance or that slightly extra advantage. So probably 90%, I would say, in, in five years, and then 10% of flair from the sort of the creative or the ideation phase. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, uh, the creative is there to invoke uh, an emotional response from humans, which is, you know, very unpredictable. So I think that's always for me where AI is going to, to struggle um, because obviously you know, creative and, and the visual impact of things is, is very personal and, and has different different iterations. So you can use the back end, as you say, machine learning to be able to try more. Um, but AI, I think, is certainly as it stands at the moment, um, and hopefully for the foreseeable was going to struggle with that. Um, I mean, that, that does just bring us um, to, to the, the point um, that, that Gregor um, mentioned uh, around um, coronavirus and seeing um, the actual content of games, reference it um, a bit more. And interesting one just for the wider games community, whether, you're, whether you see any um, changes to, to the content of the games that's gonna that's gonna reference the, what's going on at the moment. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know what specifically. Um, uh, I don't actually. James Cooper, are you still on the line? Oh, let's hope James is. Could we do a poll, James? Could we do a live poll? Is that possible? Um, Hi. Yeah, I am on, still on the line. Sorry, I just uh, uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, sure. We, a live poll. Um, I can give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> right. no, just because so because we had this discussion, you know, yeah. just to be completely upfront, we had this discussion um, uh, last week and this week, um, you know, about is it is it appropriate to launch topical games around coronavirus? Um, oh. You know, so um, there are some games coming out around supermarket shopping and supermarket mm -hmm. hoarding. Um, you know, there's some toilet roll kind of concepts and people are starting to bring in a few games that, that kind of reference the virus. Um, and as a company, we took the decision, we don't think it's appropriate. Um, and um, it's, although it's opportunistic, it doesn't feel appropriate. Could we do a poll to yep. the, the audience? Okay, I'll see if I can get that launched. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming, did you? All right. <laughs> to ask if people think it's, it's a good or bad idea or appropriate or not appropriate to launch Corona um, related games at this point in time. Because I'd be useful to get that feedback from our perspective as a wider audience. So, and then Naveen had a question um, about: Would you rather auto strategies via an FMP like Smartly uh, or through Adjust? Could there not be an issue here? Um, I'm not entirely sure what what you mean. I think my reference was I used to work at Smartly. We didn't work with Smartly at Coda. Um, I think the the two platforms solve very different problems. I think FMPs like, like Smartly and others are really amazing around creative automation and, and um, 
being able to set up thousands of campaigns with different ads to different audiences in different cities. Um, so for example, Uber, you know, want to run different offers for drivers and riders in, in Amsterdam or London or New York or Tokyo. Whereas with, with, with Just Automate, what we're doing is, is, is optimizing our bids and, and budgets currently across all of our networks. So I think they're solving a different problem. I don't think there's a, um, I don't think there's a crossover there. Great. Great. Well, while uh, while your ad hoc poll is is running, um, we'll take uh, we'll take one. Oh, here, here we go. go. Oh, there we go. Interesting. Okay. Predominantly no. Then I would say I'd say are you crazy? Our classes as, as as no. Um, so that's what fifty six. Not sure. It's probably yeah sixteen. Okay. Cool. Thank you guys. That's very useful. Great. Well, yeah. Thank, thanks so much for for your your time, Andrew. Um, it's been it's been fascinating to to hear from you. And um, thank you to everyone to to join uh, for for joining. If you do want more information on on Adjust Automate, then please um, do feel free to to get in touch. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it back. Great. Thanks, Andy. That was brilliant and good to see Andrew here as well. As he said, he did come to our, one of our first events in London. He's probably forgotten this. He also came to Berlin and now virtually. So it's a, a hat trick now for him. So yeah, always interesting hearing you talk. So thanks for joining us today. And uh, yeah, I thought it was a really good session. It will be available as a replay afterwards um, on the site, hopefully. Um, so that should be good and um thanks all for joining us uh later today that's the last session for this afternoon but later this evening five o'clock we've got an app store optimization uh, ask me anything session with uh, dave from gummy cube he's based on the west coast hence the time zone but hopefully i'll work out for for some of you but uh yeah uh, please give a virtual round of applause for our two panelists and um thanks very much for joining us Cheers, guys. Thank you.